like we're starting this thing. All right. Hi. Welcome to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. We are live in person at Macomb Community Scott College, Building E. I'm the, your president, Bob Tremblay. Um, so we are live on YouTube and Zoom. Uh, as a tradition, what we like to do at these meetings is go through the audience and have the uh, audience say their name. And so I'm going to start. I'm Bob Trembley. Hi. Eduardo Saluso. Bob Outreach. And as you can see, I seriously need to get a camera point out to the audience. So uh so uh we have any new members here? No, it doesn't look like we have any new members. Well, I'll sit there. And uh David Bransky is online, so you're not renewing your membership live with him, but you can still do it by PayPal. So, uh, announcements. Uh, do we have any calendars at all left? David, do you have the, cal who have the calendars? Um, I've got a couple here with me, but I think Mark also has some, if I'm not mistaken. No, Mark doesn't. Mark doesn't. No. Okay. Alter and over. So we have like a I... couple calendars left. If you, want, if you want one of our 2024 Watts after photo calendars, you can get them for $15, but apparently not tonight from here. Maybe Cranbrook. And... I will be at the Cranbrook meeting. All right. <laughs> um, WAS wearables are purchasable from Mark Kezier, who is here in the audience. You can check to see what's available in our newsletter, which is really amazing. Um, our, we have gotten eclipse coming up in a couple weeks. Yikes, it's it's coming up fast. Pardon me? Yeah. Who, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> so if, if, if you haven't figured out what you're doing yet, you probably should, because Ohio doesn't want you stopping on the side of the road to watch it. Um, my wife and I are going to be at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and we're going to have these, these WASP flyers there and a table. Um, because I asked for power, because I always set up at these things with my laptop, they're putting us inside with a giant TV where they're going to be simulcasting a NASA broadcast of the eclipse, but we're going to go out and see it, obviously. So... Uh, so, uh, Stargate message board. Okay. Our next meeting is going to be April 1st at Cranbrook, and we're not having a long presentation, but we're going to have an extended snack break and discussion session. So we're going to be doing this out on the tables, out by the gift shop, not in, not in the auditorium area. We're encouraging the membership to uh, bring munchies and snacks and some of the pass around. You can bring a meal, but don't expect to feed everyone. And you may or may not have power. So uh, the, uh, I'm talking to the board. The board will be providing um, pot, munchies, uh, plates, and silverware. Well, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's pretty much it. So... Yeah, if you if you want to bring something, uh, just let us know, and so we don't have like like fifteen duplicates. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> there was an email going around from uh, Glack. Apparently, uh, the Island Lake State Park is going to be uh, uh, working on construction of their parking lots, and so it's looking like we might not be able to do astronomy be at the beach at the same place this year. So. Um, and the email between between all these GLAC members where they're looking at all these different places. Kensington was mentioned, so I took it upon myself since we had a relationship with the Metro Parks last year. I reached out to my my rep at Kensington saying, hey, and uh, so we'll, we'll see what's going on with that. But there, there's a good chance that like, Astronomy at the Beach is going to be at a different venue this year. So, uh, quick officer reports. Uh, uh, how many? Uh, how many? Did anybody here go to that brother guy presentation? Anybody there? Yeah, you were there. We got about three people in the in the audience here. Uh, we had about what five, six WAS members in the audience all told. The uh, auditorium for the public viewing on the, uh, at four p.m. was absolutely packed. There was like standing room only, and uh, it was funny because the week before, Mike Narlock emailed me and says, "Can you make sure you email the membership? We only we've only sold fifty seats, so." They sold they sold more than 50 seats. 
But uh, <laughs> afterwards, we uh, took Brother Guy out to the Kirby's Coney Island at Woodward and uh, Square Lake Road, and he had a, a Coney dog and a Verner's. He spends half the year in Tucson and half the year in Rome, but okay that that that's where he lands and spends actually a couple of days but his schedule for the next week was just all over the place he, he's back to having an absolutely insane schedule and, and our, our new development director at the vatican observatory foundation is just packing his calendar up i mean he was he was he did he did he did the cranbrook thing here he went out to white lake the next day he's up in houghton or uh, if they're marquette right now visiting his brother then he's coming back down here and doing another event then then uh, he, he's just yes he's the director he's the director of the vatican observatory and the president of the vatican observatory foundation the fundraising arm but uh so yeah so uh, we went to kirby's coney island and uh so, um, Dale, did you want to do something really quick? Uh, beg people for lectures. Yeah. Dale Parton, our first. Yeah. I'm here to beg for lectures. <laughs> um, what I actually need most urgently is a couple of short presentations, one in May, uh, and one in June. I can always use long presentations too, Dale. Alan Bow just volunteered to give one in August. Uh, thank you, Dale. Um, but I could use a short presentation in May and also in June. So if you have any glimmers of an idea, let me know. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Right. Okay. Uh, David, yes. anything, any, tre any treasure report really quick? Hey, we got some big fancy stuff going on. Um, so we actually got the um, card from the bank on the account. And the card's been pretty busy. We actually have a signed catering contract with Ukrainian Cultural Center for the, uh, for the year-end dinner um, on December 5th. Nice. So that's been accomplished. We got a signed contract with them right now. Already. Wow. Yeah. We just, just get come up with a speaker now. <laughs> uh, so that's been done. Uh, I've also been shopping on the Amazon for a cash box and briefcase. Um, so we can, I guess it comes up to about $115 or so without tax. So uh, if I can go ahead and hit the go button, or do we want to table it to the board meeting to talk uh, talk further about it? We, we could do that. The board meeting's next, what, in okay. four days? Yeah, yeah, four days. Speaking of which, yeah, the board members, board meeting in four days. Um, <laughs> and as far as the account itself, uh, as far as our end of February statement, we had um, twenty five thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars and dot oh one cents. So we got plenty of money in there to do whatever. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody need Ria. money? <laughs> Ria, do you want to talk really quick about the open house and what's coming up? Yeah, last uh, open house, actually, we had really good luck, clear skies, and we had about 60 people out, and we had about four scopes out on the field. That was really great. Uh, it was an excellent night. Um, next open house is uh, this this Saturday, so uh, I don't know what the weather's going to be like, uh, but maybe you never know. It may clear up a little bit, so hopefully we'll see some people out. Um, also coming up uh, soon in in on April, uh, 20th, we have some scouts uh, that wanted to come out to the observatory. It's not an open house night, but uh, I'll be out there for them. And also on May 4th, it's also a Saturday. Uh, on May 4th, we're going to have probably about 80 scouts and maybe something like 20, 30 guides. So it's going to be a lot of people. And it would be um, helpful to have somebody out maybe to help with the crowds a little bit. And of course, I'll be out there as well. Um, so do that's uh, to, all I have right now. Send, do we need to send an email blast out to the membership about that May 4th event? Um, I included, I think I included 
uh, maybe Jeff on that. Um, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Secretary Charlie, anything to say? No. Last week, or last month, or in the wasp. Yeah, you go, you go. And uh, I do want to say something guys. It's very uh, interesting, and anybody that mentioned something great, just people who and I thought that was great. I the bathroom in the middle because I had a lot of coffee. And I could actually see that. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Bag of stuff. So it was literally standing room only for that event. Wow. 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 All right. Thanks. And outreach, Jeff. Any anything new going on? Yeah, he's coming up here. There we go. My notes. So uh Mark did some stuff. Angelo and Bob back there did some stuff. So they're gonna email me so I can get it in the next report. Uh stuff coming up. Uh the Discovery Learning Center. I advertised this at our Cranbrook. Yeah. Yes, because I, I don't want to do all of these by myself. Uh, but fourth Saturday of every month, they have their STEM nights. Um, it's from like noon to four. I talked to them today. It's kind of a... People are just kind of filtering in and out between those hours. So they told me, hey, like show up when there's enough people, give a presentation. But uh, it's like younger audience. So, you know, if you're trying to give presentations at a collegiate level, this isn't the place, but if you want to look like a genius to a bunch of 10 and 12 year olds, that's what I will be doing. That's Mars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then uh, some other stuff's a little bit further away. Uh, obviously eclipse. Don't call me. I will not help you. Um, and then after that, uh, the very next Saturday, I believe, is uh, Wayne State and Belle Isles uh, Statewide Astronomy Night. Ooh. Go and have a good time. Or if you want to help us, you know, bring some scopes out there. They always want more scopes. It's not the best seeing conditions. It's Belle Isles. We're going to want to leave you last, so get with me. On okay. When is that? I think it's the 12th. April, April 12th. It's that Saturday uh, with a contingent that if the weather is bad, they'll do the next day if the weather's good. Um, there's some other stuff, but it's far enough that I'll talk about it at the next meeting. So, and then if you're looking to do any outreach, just email outreach, find me, and uh, as things come up, we'll uh, we'll get you, we'll get you done. Uh, speaking of outreach, if anybody is not going to where they can see the total solar eclipse on April the 8th. I could use help. I'm going to be at Cranbrook. Okay. Uh, they provide us with a free place to uh, meet once a month, and they expect us to help them from time to time. So uh, I'm going to be there. If somebody could help that's not going south, let me know. Thank you. Jeff, you've not gotten any requests from Cranbrook for like scout stuff? Yeah. No. We used to we used to get like four of those a year easy. I'll have to poke them and see what's going on with that. Oh, by the way, the last Cranbrook meeting, I uh, I was talking with the fellow who uh, sits up at that desk and checks us in the entire time. He uh he thanked us profusely for starting uh, hybrid events because he says, you guys were the first and it gave me practice because everybody wants those now. And he says, it got me a lot of practice with you guys. And he also thanked us a lot for changing from WebEx to Zoom because WebEx don't play nice with Cranbrook. And if anybody's been having trouble getting connected up at Cranbrook, the last time I was there, boom, I was right on. And I went and I said that to him and he said, good, we've changed the Wi-Fi throughout the campus. so." Cranbrook's, Cranbrook's updating their tech. 
Okay. Uh, publication of the Chalia is not on, I don't think. No, she's not. Okay. So, uh, and Dale Teamy, newsletter's up. Anything you want to say about that? Uh, you're breaking up. The, the newsletter is up. The newsletter's up. Yep. Yeah. Any anything else you want to put? Anything else you want to say? You uh. And not thank for. Always looking for content. Always looking oh. for that. Yeah. We're breaking up. We are breaking up. All right. So if you need to contact the board for any reason, you can do so at board at warrenastro dot org. Okay. So astronomy in the news. We have. 5599 confirmed exoplanets up from 5573 uh last month. Uh 7114 candidates up from 7052. Uh and the exoplanet archive is added spectra for two more exoplanets and I I actually clicked on that news this morning and went in. They have every planet that they've taken spectra of available. You can just get to it and see the spectra yourself at the Exo NASA's Exoplanet Archive. That's pretty darn cool. So, uh, Starship 3, at, su at a successful launch, all the engines were lit, hot separation worked, first stage failed to slow down and crashed into the ocean, although it was going to crash into the ocean anyway, but it did not slow down enough. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and uh, video from Starship, I got I got an image of it here. Shows the red re-entry plasma forming on the bottom of the sh of the the vessel, and uh, a lot of uh, Kerbal Space Program players on forums were just like, "Cool looking." So yeah, that was that was really cool to see. Uh, one point that Scott Manley made in a video of his that is even if. The first stage of this rocket is not reusable at this point. SpaceX has a launch vehicle that can get well over 100 tons of payload into orbit right now. And it's given the SLS a run for its money. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out over the next several years. Well, well, hey, they're making progress every single time, but I have a feeling it's going to be a while before we see clamps catching a first stage. Yeah, how many standard products did they use before they worked? Oh, my goodness. Oh, ever seen videos of all the explosions of all those early rockets? Holy mackerel. So, uh, several, and, and uh, every month, uh, the, the uh, an IAU uh, group, uh, publishes a, a list of new named asteroids and observations and stuff. And I, I got this one a couple days ago and looking through it, several, and I mean almost every entry in this one were members of the New Horizons mission. They all got asteroids named after them. So uh, that's pretty cool. So we don't have uh, David Levy on. Fortunately, I don't think he's on. Let's do the view here. So we do not have a David. Maybe. All right, so there's not going to be any astro poetry. Um, SDO images, I've got these up. I'm going to share some images here. Share the screen. I'm going to share the that thing. Okay, so what you're seeing there, you should be seeing a yellow sun. That is uh, the corona and very, very active flip over to this page. This is from spaceweather.com. These are all the active sunspots. And, and once again, my phone, I'm getting geomagnetic storm flare, flare. And my wife has signed up for this. So she, her phone is vibrating about the same time as mine. So we're both sitting here. Phones go, we're like, flare. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, do we have any astronomy questions, you guys? Yes, uh, you have. I actually read the article on the JWST uh, uh, detection of carbon dioxide on an exoplanet. Okay, Jeff. Jeff McLeod asks, has anybody read the article about the JWST detecting carbon dioxide on an exoplanet? I have not. I, I just saw a blurb. I didn't have yeah, I was going to bed. Like it's the wrong time for me to go down a rabbit hole. 
<laughs> it would probably be that, wouldn't it? I think the, the book was that, like, this is probably the best time in the city to be Really? Okay. Not one of the archives. Well, okay. the, the, the Exoplanet Archive would be the place to hit that up. So let's hit that up at the uh, at the break. Yes. Exoplanet. Yes. And how many? Fifty-five ninety-nine confirmed seventy-one fourteen candidates. Most of those are from Kepler. Um, that's a really good question. Okay, the question was when when I mentioned earlier uh, about uh, the uh, confirmed and candidate exoplanets. Uh, Dale Parton asked, "What does it take to get a candidate confirmed?" And that is a really good question. So I, I don't know, but we can find that out during the break. I'm sure, and, and I, I, I think I, um, I think you're right. I think it's about. I think they have to. Well, so what's really cool when it comes to exoplanets, there's there's a couple of these citizen science things now. There's there's folks with scopes like ours detecting exoplanets and and tracking them. You saying Jupiter is not a planet? Right. <laughs> Yeah, the, the joke in the audience was here is that well Jupiter hasn't cleared its orbit. You got the Trojan asteroids, and he's kind of right. Okay, so we have any astrophotos? Anybody have any astrophotos they want to share? Yeah, oh well. I did a couple, but I don't know whether it's been a while. You see them on Astro Ben. Oh, what can do that? Let's go to Astro Ben. Dot com. Uh, Astro Bin. Astro Bin space DR Holland. If you Google search it, it'll be D R H A. H O. H O. D R H O. L L E N. Oh, I'm going Astro Bin. There we go. There so I got go. one of uh, a nebula I've been working on. <laughs> one of the. Uh, one of the comments. There, there, share that. I am sharing Dale Hollenbaugh's Astro Bin. So which one here? This one? Uh, well, the first one is is um, a nebula. It is a G C fourteen ninety nine, the California Nebula. That's the California Nebula. Nice. You want to get up here and talk? Okay, yeah, we're getting deal. Come up here and talk about these. All right. So, uh, this is the California Nebula here. So, it's fairly deep. I, I put 12 hours worth of integration time. So, that was over four nights. It's with a color camera with a duo narrow band filter, but I sort of enhanced the light from. Men kid, I think it is the star there, which is illuminating this area here. But it's mostly an emission nebula. And super uh, cool. Um, this is a, a 51 millimeter, um, called a William Optics Red Cat 51. 51 millimeter objective. Focal length is 250 millimeters. So California Nebula is quite large. What kind of field are you looking for? I don't know in degrees. Prop sensor, APSC. No, I mean the picture you took. That's the point. I I crop five percent of the fuzz on the edges. That would have made it probably about two and a half degree, three degree, four degree. Some, some, yeah, that sounds about right. I use an APSC sensor for that. 
not a full print. Uh, but it's not a little sense. So uh, likewise, the same uh, camera telescope setup used for this comet. Oh, that's pretty. Look at that. It is, but because of the moon and each each night it's getting worse. So like a week ago, Monday was the best day. I, I think. Is this the one that's going to be visible during the eclipse? It is. Uh, comet is 12 P Pons Brooks. Period. The comet. I'm guessing because 12 P is a low number, it's one of the first cataloged. Like 1 P is Halley. So they, they cataloged in the 1800s. Yeah, for those of you who might not know, um, uh, with, when the eclipse happens, the total solar eclipse on April 8th, Jupiter, Saturn, and this comet are going to be visible in the sky. When the sun is eclipsed. So, so we, we took some images on this uh, a week ago Monday. But for my house, it dipped down into the tree, so I only got 90 seconds on it. Or about three minutes. About three minutes on it. And I was like, Ugh. so I drove out to a cornfield so I had the amount of distance before I got to any trees. And this is about 50 minutes worth of integration time. So if you zoom in That's... on the head of the comet, you can see a little bit of structure there. Zoom in that. Wow. So it's pretty bright. It, it's relatively speaking, this is the best comet I think we've had in over a year. You are submitting that for next year's calendar, right? Wow. There was a lot of things. So there's some there's some it's gorgeous. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that was about 12 hours of me working on the computer to fix that. Oh, you fixed it. You, you stack on the stars to get a star image, and then the comet's blurred. You erase the comet. You stack on the comet to get the comet nice and sharp, and the stars are blurred. You are removed yeah, from each of these separate blocks. Oh. Remove the stars, restack, reintegrate, renormalize, and then try to stretch and enhance fix in sight. Uh, well, no, there's no way. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he used here, here, Here's the stuff here. So it, it Astro Bin not only allows you to upload full resolution, you don't have any. Facebook cropping or anything that kind of stuff, but I can actually look here. Like, oh well, how much time? There was thirty-three stack frames at ninety seconds each. Oh, all this data here, but it lists all the software I use. So there's a lot. Fix and is the main thing. Photoshop a little bit, de noise. Some of the newer techniques for people who do astrophotography, they they'll, they'll recognize a lot of those there. But um, wow. But yeah, this is this is a good comet. It's it's not quite naked eye. Magnitude five point six at last check. I guess about a week ago. Uh, it is just just before sunset. Just before sunset. Right now. It is southwest of Andromeda, if that makes sense. So Andromeda's here. The comet's here, setting into the as it sets down. Uh, triangulum galaxies a little bit up. I have seen some very wide field images that catch all three. Um, and you have about an hour. Now you might have about 45 minutes before it sets from darkness into the sun. Every day it's getting worse. Yeah. It's hard to see. It's hard to see. I forgot my binoculars when I went out to the cornfield. I would have hopefully been able to see maybe something was ahead. It was beautiful. It was really low in the sky. But it's it's a nice comet. Uh, it's going to be closer to the sun April 8th for the eclipse and uh, visible up near Jupiter, sort of to the to the left of the sun. You can see it in Solarium or whatever. You know, you simulate where it's going to be. But uh, It'll be brighter then. So for four and a half minutes, you, you might be able to see something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to image it. 
it's too, too much, too much, but I think someone will. I think someone's going to have four and a half minutes of integration on that yeah. journey eclipse, but not me. <laughs> Interesting target, but not me. Oh, thank you. That was gorgeous. All right. Yeah. All right. If we don't have any other questions or ask for photos, we can take our break now. There's uh, a question in the Zoom chat. Oh, there was. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Let's hit that. Uh, what do you all think of the newer smart telescopes such as Sea Star S50 or the Vespa 3? Anybody using them? Uh -huh. I'm going to do a presentation in August on just that. Uh, Dale said he's going to be doing a presentation in August on just that. Like three or four. Yeah. Okay. Which Dale? There's three of us. Anybody online or here have one? Does anybody online have one at one of these things? One guy says, I like the C Star S50, great support from the factory. Mm -hmm. um, when I was out at the VO, um out in in in, in early uh, january a guy had something called a dwarf two it was it was one of these and it was it was pretty amazing and it was like sold out it was like five hundred dollars something like that the guy who comes to the club i i forget his name but he comes to stargate and he's brought that three or four times the before. dwarf two uh someone came with a sea star last last this past month uh, that was me. I I brought the Sea Star out there to the open house, and I sent you the best uh, pick of the evening yeah. to the email. Brian? Oh, Brian. Yeah. All right, I forgot your name. That's the actual first I've seen, but I'm going to order one this week, so I'll do a presentation. I ordered them in the open, so I know. And the people that have them all are open. You know, it's, it's not quite level thing, it's a little bit next level less like the one we're using, but it's still really good. Uh, the, the real, uh, I guess, positive comment was Dave Holt, who is the uh, absolute hardcore, the best visual observer I know, who would never get a, you know, the electronic scope has one. He loves it. <laughs> Bob Berta has said that the boss to use it. Anybody can use says it. that four four people in the Oakland club own uh, uh, one of these Sea Star S fifties, and they all love it. Even even somebody who swore he'd never get one of these types of scopes. So I will be looking into one of these too. All right, so uh, we have nothing else. We're going to take our break for what a twenty minutes, half hour. What do you want to do? Let's do twenty minutes. Or, or close enough. Let, 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 let's reconvene at 8 o'clock straight up. And uh, see you see you in about 20, 25 minutes. And I'm going to look up the C-Star S50 out here while I'm waiting. I don't know what this is. Oh, that's what that thing looks like. Okay. Hey, look, B and H photo. What a surprise! All right, I'm sharing this screen just so you guys can see what we've been talking about here. Let's see. Share that image. Share it. This is the C Star S50 that people have been talking about. It goes on your. It goes on your. That's about the price of the brute too. Let's see if I can do that one too. I think that was it. Yeah, it's the it's I'm sorry, it's the dwarf. The dwarf too, not the brute. The weight of the the dwarf two. That is not the dwarf two. Come on, Amazon. Anybody the Smart telescope. Dwarf swing. There it is. So this is what somebody recommended to me when I was uh, out in Tucson in earlier. This is. Uh, one we've been talking about here, so six of one half dozen of another. 
I'll just have to get one of each and do a comparison. So is this all based on the formulas or, or is he testing uh, here? I've stuck them over here. I recently heard what it's based on. on uh, is the theory right. or no, oh, is there his his the it's experience? Yeah, yeah, he has right. his twister or he clicks the he's going back. I'm hoping to have four different camera sets. Okay, I don't know if I have some. Yeah, we're simple. I don't want to see it. I don't know how to miss it. Well, we got four and a half minutes. I figured the believe the process. Yeah, you know, it's worse than you. The last one left, I got a lot of pictures. Oh, just a small bit of that. I didn't look at it. Sorry, yeah. So let's see, this is a 50 milliliter F5. You tell me what you are. Yeah, 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 very impressive. Give me specs. There we go. Four mil. Versus a 50 millimeter. Monday and Monday, they have a price of $712. 4.2. Get out of there. Jeez, he's in the way. F5. Hmm. 50 millimeter for 500. Or 24 millimeter. Or, look, I like this one. So I guess I'll be talking to Bob Luda about this one. Well, this is a top seller, too. Apparently, it's pretty popular. I'll give you that. All right, well, I'm going to sign off from here and go eat some munchies. But they also have the only, uh, you know, they can make that art and just allow them to be on call up. And you see some of the trade sharing all the time. And you see the floor, North Star, and then you're going to have a little. Yeah, yeah, so real. Yeah, I don't know. You know, that's what I'm saying. Oh, with that, Brian shared a picture of the moon. I expand that. Yes, we can. That was taken with a C star. Uh, does it brand the images like that when you take a picture? Yeah, you can turn that feature on and off. Um, and if you're doing a time exposure, it'll show you the cumulative time that went in to make that particular image.
Dale, can you allow Bob to share the screen? Okay. Say, so Dale, can you allow uh, Bob here to uh, share the screen? I can do that. Right? Presentation. That's me there. So I'm on. Dale, where's the thing? Sure. Dale, it's down here, but Dale has to allow you to share. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. Dale, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, uh, we need uh, Bob to be able to share the screen. It says all participants can share. I'm sorry, say that again. Hmm. Somebody, else is somebody else already sharing yours? No, I'm uh, not sharing anymore. Saturdays are my day to sleep in so to make up for not sleeping during the week. I also got to plug you. Plug you. Plug you. They might have to. Um, so, uh, only before I always had to yeah, share the screen. Say, Dale, what was the issue with sharing the screen again? Or, oh, oh, God. You have this on a, on a drive? You have this on a, on, a, on, a, on a key? I've got one in my pocket. No, I've got one, yeah. Okay. We're going to move Bob's presentation over to the WASH laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah, because sharing is not coming up on, on his uh, laptop here for whatever reason. That's weird because uh, all participants are allowed to share. It's a real. Which one? That one? Uh, what's Solar astronomy? Yeah. Yeah, there are so many things. So it's. The speaker here is a line that feels like yours. Is it a camera? It is essentially a camera. You remove the secondary mirror. And it turns your primary mirror on the Schmidt cast there. Yeah. 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 Ye
So Dale, can you uh, see what the uh, solar astronomy thing right on the screen right now? I guess I can. Do I have this muted again? Hold on. Yes, I do. All right. You're not muted anymore. You guys see the presentation on the screen? I see it. Okay. I'm checking to make sure. We're good to go. Okay. Um, I want to do a quick. We're gonna get started here, but really quick. Um, the Ford is having their swap meet tomorrow, Saturday. We will be. Hey, uh, Jeff, we're gonna send out an email blast on that uh, Ford swap meet. Are we? Should we send out an email blast? Okay. Expect to see an email blast on the, about the Ford swap meet. 
So with that, we're starting our presentation. Well, I have to say, I wrote out some things about Bob Berta. Bob. I wrote out some stuff about Bob Berta, but half of the things I said were going to was going to say it right on the first slide. <laughs> uh, he's in all these different astronomy clubs, solar system ambassador, uh, in a night sky network for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I mean, it's right there. Um, he started off in California, born and raised there, became a engineer working for a Electric utility company. Uh, pardon me. A power company. A power company. Yeah. Oh. yeah, in California, and then he retired from that, and his wife dragged him back to Michigan, because that's, I guess, where she was from. Um. So. He he's really into outreach and astrophotography. He's also into music, man of many talents, uh, plays various instruments, um, and he's often an officer in these various organizations, including this one. Um, so I'm anxious to hear what he has to say about solar imaging. Come on up, Bob. Okay, first of all, make sure everybody can hear me on the online. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll lower this down a little bit. Sorry, button to lower it, the chair. Here, maybe here, maybe. Well, I have to stick with it, I think. <laughs> A little bit. I'm not sure how. That's all right. I'll have to do it. I'll just stand. That's okay. 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 Anyway, uh, those of you in the club who know me, I'm, uh, as Jill mentioned, I'm really into the outreach part of the club, but also I'm a longtime photographer. Uh, I used to own a photo business on the side back in California for about 40 years. And, uh, so naturally, my interest in astronomy crossed into the photography, so I'm into astrophotography. Back in the days when we were still using hybrid film and uh, probably got into digital and everything. And my interests are not just in uh, nighttime astrophotography, but also daytime for the sun. Um, I've had a lot of success getting some nice pictures of that. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some techniques for doing that. But before we do, I also want to talk to something which is near and dear to my heart, and that's safety. Um, Dill mentioned I was an electrical engineer for my company for 36 years, and I got into some other positions. I ended up being a director in the law department, but my background in engineering led me into safety engineering, and I have a real interest in doing things safely. Uh, the thing that I like to emphasize is the safety parts of everything you do. In this case, uh, there are things you can do a lot of damage to yourself in uh, taking pictures, looking at the sun uh, without the proper safety equipment. Uh, one is you want to make sure your eyes are well taken care of. So don't look at the sun through a telescope, binoculars, or even naked eye unless you have approved filtration. Uh, those of you in the club who've been around you very long know what we're talking about. You have to have uh, approved filters uh, in front of your eyes but that won't work for a camera or a telescope or anything like binoculars because you can do real damage to your eyes. Even looking naked eye at the sun, you're going to cause some damage. You may not immediately recognize it until you get to be more advanced in age like I am. And you go to your uh, eye doctor. The doctor says, well, you must have been looking at the sun when you're a little bit younger because now you've got spots, permanent spots in your eye from that. So don't do that. On the other hand, most of us know 
our youthful days when we thought it was kind of fun to take a magnifying glass and to cook a bug with it, right? Well, that's what you're doing to your eyes. If you get a telescope or binoculars, look at the sun with it. So don't ever do that. Um, and again, I mentioned there are special uh, devices, which we're going to cover in this talk about uh, protecting your eyes. But in particular, since we do a lot of outreach in our club, it's very important that you make uh, sure that our clients, our people that are out there looking to our telescopes, don't make the mistake of damaging their eyes. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that's something you should always do when you go out, even though you think everybody around you is watching what they're doing, they're paying attention. You know, when you're out there doing a talk, you know, demonstration in the field, you're going to have kids running up wanting to take a fast look through your telescope. And the most important part is don't ever leave your telescope unmanned. Uh, that's when you're really opening yourself up to a big problem. Um, you know, kids will run up and see this thing sitting there, telescope sitting there and say, well, I wonder what I can see through this. And that's when you end up, you know, hurting somebody's eyes or blinding them. Um, of course, there's also an issue if you don't in injure your eyes, there's also the issue of damaging your equipment. Uh, the sun is pretty powerful. And if, things you don't want to do is if you have a schmidt cassegrain telescope, well, you can get special filters for that. Uh, don't ever take that telescope and aim it at the sun directly because it will focus that heat inside of the telescope and literally it will destroy it in just a second. Um, also, other types of telescopes, you can aim them at the sun. And you say, well, I've got a special filter on my telescope. It won't hurt the telescope, it won't hurt my eye. Did you pay attention to what your finder is, what's on your finder? You, know, you might end up setting your hair on fire. So, so be careful. And, fi and finally, the most important thing is, uh, you know, if you're going to be out in the sun, you've got to take special care when you're out there. Uh, you can get sunburn, obviously. You can get heat stroke. Uh, at least you don't have to worry about mosquito bites usually during the day. So that's one good thing. Yes. I think there is. I think you could actually focus because if, if the shell is a lens on that and that lens is going to focus the, you know, the sun's rays at a, on target point and you could damage the, just like, the yeah. Sensor, the yeah, yep. Yeah, just like if you take a uh, radar camera, aim at the sun, you know, it won't hurt the lens. What's going to hurt is where that light is focused. When it comes to the focus, what the focus point is on your chip, right? So you're probably going to wipe out your chip. That's why it's really important to make sure you have a filter on your camera. And it's also make sure you have the appropriate filter. Uh, if you go to any of the astronomy companies, Amazon, they have specific filters designed for, number one, for visual, looking at the stuff with your own eyes, and number two, for protecting telescopes. And those telescopes, sometimes they can use the same filter, but generally you're better off getting one specifically designed just for cameras. We'll get a little bit into that later on. Okay, now we covered safety. If you have any other questions, uh, I'll answer them, but if also you can save your questions throughout the talk. Or if you hop, have a hot burning question, feel free to break in and tell me. Okay, uh, there are types of filters, you know, many types, and uh, many of us in, <clears throat> in the club have those filters. So if you want to see what they're like, how they're made, how they're assembled, uh, what they're to be used for, <clears throat> you can talk to us. Some of the common ones we use are, first of all, the solar viewing glasses. When you're looking with just your naked eye, uh, you can get those for, I guess, for a couple bucks each. Uh, they're little cardboard glasses, frame, you might say, that fit over your ears, very similar to the ones you would go into a movie theater to watch a 3D movie. Uh, they have special filters in them that are designed to filter out all of the light. And if you see the ones that are appropriate, yeah. am I on camera over here? Or? I guess on here I am. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But you can move the button as a card like this, uh, which has the filter material in it. Um, when you get these, often they will say on the back of it that they meet the ISO standard. And that's a government standard that says it's appropriate for that use, for looking at the sun visually. Um, and be careful because some people say, well, I know you can take a piece of, you know, a bunch of film strips put together, maybe use that. Don't do that. Use something specifically designed for looking at the sun with your eyes. 
And I don't want to scare anybody off, but uh, the last eclipse in 2017, Amazon was selling a bunch of those solar filters, the, the cardboard mount ones, and they had to recall them all because it turned out they weren't uh, appropriate. They didn't have the right filtration. I don't know if they were fakes or whatever, but they had to recall them all. So they were they were possibly open to a lot of lawsuits. I don't know if anything happened, but it was kind of a scary thing. Uh, there are, besides those types, there are, uh, there's Bader, which is a German company. It's spelled B-A-A-D-E-R. And that material looks like a thin sheet of almost like cellophane, I guess, but a special coating on it is silver. And that filters out 99.7%, I believe, of the visible light and takes out all the UV and everything else, which is damaging to your eyes. And that material can be used over a camera lens. It can be used uh, for visually looking at it. Uh, they're great. In fact, uh, if you make filters for your camera, <clears throat> those are actually the best. Uh, you can buy glass filters. Uh, I won't mention the names of companies, which many companies also make glass filters. But the Bader is the only material which will not reduce the resolution and the, uh, the contrast of your image. Uh, this was tested by uh, Roland Crichton, who is the owner of Astrophysics. And uh, he said, they did extensive testing. That was the only material that reached the ultimate you know, sharpness and contrast and everything. Uh, but I mentioned you can also get glass filters. You can get this Bader film pre-mounted into a ring to fit over various equipment and everything. But you can also make your own. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, for the telescope, besides of the, the white light, which allows you to see just the, the sunspots on the sun, basically, uh, there are other types of filters you can get, and basically they're a lot more expensive. Uh, the one most people like to get is what they call H-alpha, which is looking at a very narrow spectrum of the light. Um, there is uh, uh, calcium K and H. Uh, there's sodium, helium, magnesium, et cetera. Um, but all these filters, I would not rush out and get one. What I would do is find out somebody who has one, and you can look at it and learn all about them because... They can get to be pretty expensive, and you don't want to buy something that's going to end up being a waste of money or a doorstop. So talk to people that have those. Um, also, as in all astronomy equipment, a lot of times you can get a better deal by buying it used. A lot of times people are selling their their old solar gear uh, so they can buy the latest, greatest thing. So that might be an option. Um, okay, I have up in this slide, it says telescope types and filtration used. Um, the telescopes, there's that's something you really want to pay a lot of attention to. Um, as we go into these different types of devices to filter out the sun, some of them, some of them specifically say it cannot be used with a larger than a such and such ap ap um, aperture. Uh, some of them say do not use it with certain types of telescopes. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, a Schmidt Cassegrain, you have to pay a lot of attention to the type of gear you have on that because if you have the incorrect combination, you can destroy your telescope because of the heat that generates up inside. Um, you have refractors, um, like in all things, the size matters. Everybody heard, hears, hears about aperture fever. Well, for solar, you really don't want to have a big aperture. Uh, generally, uh, if you get around, say, 50 to maybe 80 millimeter, 90 millimeter aperture uh, for a solar H-alpha, that's all you need because the sun obviously is very, very bright. You don't need a lot of um, aperture for that. The big thing you'll find out is if you go to a really big aperture, you'll start losing a little bit of resolution, but also you lose the ability to see all the time. Um, because just like a nighttime seeing during periods of watching, even just within seconds of each other, the seeing will go up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm going to show you some examples of that later. And uh, if you have like a Newtonian or even a Schmidt Cassegrain, you can get uh, your Bader Astro Solar Film and put on those, and you don't have to use the full aperture. And I'll describe how to do that also. <clears throat> okay, here's some examples of the basic eye protection. The first top one is a, uh, that's, I think Coronado made that, but you can buy those from many, many companies online, go to Amazon. Go to all the astronomy companies, they all have those. In fact, if you go to your library, you may be able to get them for free at your city libraries. Um, 
that is for just looking without any magnification, just looking at the sun directly. Below it, that is a device that Celestron was handing out at the last solar eclipse. And this is actually a little miniature binocular. I think it was about two power, three power binocular. And the way you focus it is you squeeze the sides of it and that focus it. You don't have to trill a knob or anything. And a little piece of cardboard sitting on top, that's like a shade to keep the red sun off of you. So it works pretty good. Okay, this is a couple examples of solar filters I made. Um, the one on the far left, a little round one with the little white knobs on it, that was made to fit over my uh, I finder scope for one of my telescopes. And uh, the little white knobs on there, reason for that, they're screws, little nylon screws, and you can make sure that thing is in place, not going to fall off. It's very important, especially for public viewing. You don't have a, uh, a solar filter on your telescope that can be easily jostled and fall off. You want to make sure it's in place or a tight fitting. Um, the, the bigger one, that was for an, my 11-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And if you have this type of a filter, Bader, you can cover the full aperture and you can actually see it. It's perfectly safe to look through it through an 11-inch telescope. But you don't need one that big. So what you can do is cut a, um, a inner ring using thin cardboard and cut a smaller one, You know, maybe three inches diameter or so. And you can stop it down. This will actually give you more resolution because, again, you don't have to have a lot of light coming into that big aperture. All you need is just want to get your resolution. So this way you can use this for your big telescopes. I will say that uh, one time I did use that 11 inch and there was a particular period when this is about 15 years ago, I think. There was a lot, a lot of tiny, tiny, tiny uh, sunspots almost looked like freckles all over the sun. And with this, with 11 inch, I was able to resolve those really clearly. It was amazing. I never said anything since then. Uh, with the smaller one, you probably won't see that. So there is a difference by getting the bigger one. I, down below, it says making your own filter cells. Well, you can buy this material pre-mounted in rings that fit over different telescopes. Uh, you can uh, make your own though and save a lot of money. Uh, this beta astral solar film, you have a choice of buying it in I don't remember the exact size, but you buy 10 or eight by 10. $44. Yeah. And then you can get it into a roll, like yeah. 15 inches. Yeah, or big sheets. Yeah. Because I used to buy eight by 10 sheets. And then also you can buy, I think it's, I don't know what the exact size, maybe 15, 20 inches by 15 or so. I would buy the big sheets. And the reason I would buy the big sheets, when I was in San Francisco, I, would, I still am a member of the San Francisco Amateur Astronomer Club. And what we would do, I would do, I would make filters for people and I'd sell them. So I'd buy the material, big sheets of it, and I'd custom make them to fit anything you want. So uh, I've made them to fit binoculars. I made them to fit all my telescopes. And the way you do that, you get cardboard. Uh, I think it's, they call it single weight cardboard from your local Michael store, whatever. It's very thin. And you take that, you cut a strip about inch and a half, two inches long. Take a ring of that, right? Take that and you wrap it around your telescope and you use Elmer's glue and you glue it to the end. So you've got this one ring sitting around your telescope. Now you take another identical ring, lay it on top of that first one you put down and that, that one you glue all the way around so it mounts to it. Then you get one more ring. So now you've got three rings glued together, right? So you now have a ring. It's about probably that thick, okay? Now what you do is you take another ring, same thing. You put that on top of the last three you glued together, but this one you don't glue to it. Then you glue the end of that together, so you got this loose ring that swings around on the other one. Now you take another strip and glue that on top of the last strip you just put down. So you bump another layer of three strips of this material. So now you have an inner and outer ring. This material actually is uh, flexible, very flexible, and you can put it over the top of one, take the other ring and slide it over it, and it'll act like a drum. It'll pull it down and fit it nice and smooth all the way around. And you might say, well, wait a minute. That ring on the left, I can see the wrinkles in that. Actually, that's what you want. You don't want it really tight because if you get it really tight, it causes stress in the image. And you get, um, I guess, striations and everything as a result of that. So it's okay to have a little bit of sag in there. No big deal. Once you're finished, as you can see on the right side, if you look on the inner part of that uh, filter cell I made. I have staples in there. I use staples to hold 
the inner to the outer ring, so it won't move. So now you have this all assembled. So that's the way you do that. Um, I even made some for a uh, Canon, uh, what do you call it? The, the, focus, what, one that focuses automatically. And uh, this is one Bob Noya had. And I made one for him. And that one, it doesn't have two separate binoculars. It's got like everything in one big, like an oval shape. So I made an oval shape filter for him. So you can make one to fit everything you've got. It's amazing. It's very easy. And again, I used to do this and make them for my friends. And I'd charge them a couple of bucks. So before long, I'd pay off all of them. But my solar filter and the remaining part, I would get for free for mine. <laughs> Okay, this is a uh, one of my scopes. This is a regular uh, refractor, no special solar scope or anything. What this has on it, though, is in this case, it's a, uh, a Herschel, what they call it, a Herschel wedge. And that is a device that takes the sun into your telescope. And there's a, where your normal diagonal mirror would be, instead of a mirror there, it has a uh, ceramic. It's actually from the space program. You can actually put the sun on that hundreds and hundreds of degrees, and it absorbs it all, doesn't hurt it. And it's pretty cool because you don't even need a finder scope with that, because on the back of this, uh, if you look on the left picture there, there's a little like an X I drew on that little piece of white material. That is actually like a milk glass on back there, and some of the light image passes through there, and so what you end up with is the sun shows up on that little white image, so you don't need a regular finder scope. Uh, and this actually is the ultimate. If you can get one of these, these are even better than the beta solar film. And these, you can get all different combinations of filters. You can put a camera on that and everything else. But again, this is not the cheap way to go. These are more, pri they're more pricey. Uh, probably, in this case, it's about 500 bucks, I believe now. Uh, you can buy it. Some are a little bit cheaper, around 350 or so. But they are a cool thing, and they're really neat to take, uh, take your refractor and give a double life to it. And now you can use that for outdoors, for uh, solar imaging, or you can use it for viewing, or you can use it for regular terrestrial viewing or night sky use. Uh, yeah, this is only usable on refractors. Uh, again, for the same reason I mentioned earlier, if you put this on your Schmidt cast grain, now all your heat's going in your telescope. You end up melting your telescope inside. So don't try to put this on a refractor or try to use it on a uh, new Newtonian or anything. This only can be worked with a refractor. In this case, this will only work up to an eight inch refractor. Um, and so what you can do is, if you have a larger than that, you could actually make an aperture ring to stop it down to six inches, five inches, whatever you want. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to have a really big telescope, but you don't want one. Okay, these, now these are the H-alpha, uh, various types of H-alpha uh, attachments or cameras, uh, or filters, rather. Um, the one on the far left is a the same telescope you saw earlier, just a regular refractor. This is an apochromatic refractor, which I use for all kinds of things, so I use it because it's handy. But you don't have to have an apochromatic. All you need is just a simple achromat, because when you're using H-alpha, you're looking at such a narrow spectrum of light. You don't care about you know, R, G, and B where they're focusing. We only have one to focus. So you can pick out your inexpensive Chinese, Japanese, whatever uh, telescope, and it works just fine. And what this telescope in the left has is, I don't know if they still make this, but Coronado used to have, um, they call it Etalon, which is the pre-filter. And it would you could get an adapter to screw onto the front of your telescopes. Um, and then in the back, uh, there's another, looks like a diagonal, like your standard diagonal. That isn't a standard diagonal. That has another filter in there. It's called your blocking filter, which is the two of those are a combination, which allows you to look at the sun and give H alpha views, which I'll show you those in a second. The Lunt on the right is the competing brand, Coronado versus the Lunt. Um, the Lunt works the same way. The difference is on the Lunt, they have that knob on the left, and that knob through air pressure actually focuses or defocuses the image slightly. So you can look at different detail across the image as far as the, uh, whether you want to look at more of the, the prominences coming off, or you want to look at the, uh, the de detail on the surface. And again, I'll have some pictures showing the differences. Um, the, the, the other style 
uh, the Coronado, what they have is a tilt device. And I think Lent also has a Lent device also. That's a little knob, but it does basically takes your front uh, filter and actually tilts it, literally tilts it a little bit. By tilting, it does the same thing. It changes the, the bandwidth of that light so you can look at different features. Between the two of them, actually, I actually, I think I prefer the uh, the Coronado because it's more immediate. You can get more immediate feedback and fine tune it. The light, you have to do a little bit more tuning and adjusting to really get it where you want it. Um, and then the bottom is a Daystar. Daystar is a company which uh, they make everywhere from relatively almost inexpensive because they're still expensive uh, up to very expensive, I mean, literally thousands and thousands of dollars uh, professional level equipment. And this device is not, it's, it's a, H alpha filter, but you have to use this on another telescope. And I can take this particular one and plug it into. Um, I haven't used it on these, I've used it on another telescope. I, I take it back, I have used it on the one on the left. Um, but uh, I'm not a real fan of those, they do work really well uh, for photography, but they're a real pain to use because you have to adjust them. There's a uh, battery powered or you know, a DC powered heater inside of it a little knob on the top of that adjust the heat of that and that by doing that you can adjust the bandwidth so you get the same thing that the other telescopes do by tilting to fine tune them for different features and everything but every time you turn that knob a little bit it takes another five minutes for stabilizing the heat so it takes a long time to use it also you have to figure out your you know the, the focal point and everything else which could be a real issue on it for solar and i'll Talk about that again a little further. Okay, now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the solar things you need to know about for solar astronomy. First of all, there is a approximately 11 year solar cycle sometimes. This is when the sun goes from minimal uh, activity to maximum and then back to minimal again. And they say it's about 11 year solar cycle, but not always. Um, during what is now known as the Maunder Minimum in 1645 to 1715, there was a period, a long period, where they had almost no activity on the sun. And as a result of that, they also caused uh, cooling of the earth to the point where they actually had glaciers moving down farther into Europe. In fact, they went down as far as the southern parts of France, even a little bit into the tip of Italy. Um, and the, the cultures erupt farther north. They actually ended up losing all those cultures because they actually starved to death because they got so cold. These glaciers, ice came down there. They actually ended up, um, cultures ended up starving to death because they couldn't get food. Um, so, again, this is only um, average, I guess you might say, 11 years. So you may find there's going to be periods which is going to go longer than that. Right now, we are supposedly about one year from reaching the peak. So we'll see, you know. Next year, we should have even more activity than we're having now. But this can vary from cycle to cycle. Some cycles, they get extreme activity. Other ones, you have very minimal. These are the various parts of the sun. Uh, and uh, the parts that I'm going to be showing, photographing, the ones that we normally are most interested in are two parts. One is the photosphere, uh, which the sun spots and everything come out very clearly. This can be seen with these white light filters, like those glasses we have, the, you know, maybe a little bit uh, uh, binoculars, a telescope, you'll be able to see that. But you won't see the prominences and the flares in the chromosphere. You know, you see that, I mean, the, yeah, the prominences with those. The prominences up above that surface, you might say. Um, the uh, kind of interesting part of this is down on the surface of the sun, the average is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is pretty hot. Um, the sunspots, the black spots you'll see in that picture there, and the pictures I'll be showing you later, those are about 1,000 degrees cooler. Um, the, the the white part or the yellow part is hotter, okay? So if you see on the pictures I'm going to show you later, the part that's much lighter yellow or almost white, that is much hotter, maybe 1,000 degrees. But you go into the, the um, out here in the... Uh, the loop out here, which is in the chromosphere, uh, out there with those prominences, heat's no longer 6,000 degrees Kelvin, it's a million degrees. So you go, why is that? How come the sun is a million degrees farther away from the sun and it's cooler in? Well, 
there's a lot of theories on that. I think we're finally, after all the years, starting to have some ideas about what it is, but I'm not going to cover that right now. We haven't got time for that. But that's something that might be for a possible talk. Okay, this is, um, again, with the filters, you can strip away parts of this. So on the right is what you would see with the uh, white light filter. You see the sunspots on there. On your left, you'll see the chromosphere, and this is with the H-alpha filter. This will allow you to see the, uh, the prominences, the flares. That's the little spikes coming off the left side of the sun. Um, you'll see the sunspots still with that filter, little black dots on there. but. Pardon? I didn't do this one. I didn't do this one. And then um, you'll see the, the white parts. Around the, that's called an active region when you have really an active area. Uh, you'll see that with an HL filter. All that granulation on that picture is not grain in the picture. What that is is the convection cells on the surface of the sun. Convection cells is the material basically bubbling to the surface. I like to compare it to boiling a pot of water, water on a stove. The water bubbles all over the stove. It doesn't make one big bubble and stop. It goes blub, blub, blub like this, right? Well, that or the convection cells coming to the surface. Okay, this is something I like to uh, quiz people on. Uh, anybody here tell me, why is the sun uh, hotter during the summer? Why is it cooler in the winter? Yeah, tilt, right. A lot of times when I ask that question, everybody says, well, I know the answer to that because this summer you're closer to the sun, right? Uh, well, wait a minute. No, because the sun, you see by this picture right here, that's the size of the sun difference just of these different months of the year. So it's hardly any difference at all. But the difference is our Earth doesn't rotate. It wobbles on this axis. As it wobbles, it tends at one part of the year aiming more towards the sun other times aims farther away. And that is why when we have summer here in the uh, United States and Australia, they're having their winter. So um, when we're having freezing cold weather here, they're having summer, which means at Christmas time, they have hot weather in Australia. Yes. In the, just a March 21st was the eternal equinox mm -hmm. twice in Yep. Oh, yeah. So anyway, that's, so I've had a lot of people, even teachers tell me, well, that's because, you know, it gets hotter in the summer because you're close to the sun. And the kids, once they learn this, they go tell their teacher, I think you're wrong. <laughs> okay, now these some of the pictures I've taken here, except for the one on the right, I did take that. was Helen Freed took that. 2015. That's a close-up of sunspots on the right. And I'll, I'll get even a better picture of that later on. I took, <laughs> but we'll see that. Okay, last August 2021, or you know, 2021, not last, but 2021, that's where the surface of the sun looked like. There is one sunspot down about 7 o'clock, a little small one down there. I think you can see it on the frame up there. A little teeny spot, not much. And that was a period of not much activity. Here's in 2021, even with low sunspot activity, you can still see a lot on the sun. I took this picture with the H alpha. You can see the areas, it's a couple of active regions and there are about 10 o'clock. There's a little action going on there. Um, there on about one o'clock or so, there's some. The white area, again, is the hotter area. The, the red, if we see red, that's a cooler area. But all of that grain you see, it's just the, the corona mass uh, excuse me, the plasma bubbling there. Okay, here's a really, really close up of a sunspot I got. Uh, the black part is called the umbra of a sunspot. Uh, the area right around it is called the preumbra. Looks like almost out beyond, it looks, almost looks like eyelashes or something out there. And all that material out there, as you can see, it all swirling around. Um, that's all basically magnetic activity that's causing that. Hey, this is, I don't remember the year I took this. I think this was last year. But this is an active region. Um, 
and you can see material swirling around there. There's sunspots where that sunspot is. Uh, as it comes to the surface, there's a lot of magnetic um, action going on, so it swirls it around. You might say, well, where do those sunspots come from? Well, these sunspots come deep, deep within the sun. They don't just go out. They take millions of years to get worked their way up, in and out, and everything else. Finally, they get to the surface. And when they do, you'll see there's distortion in there, but you'll also sometimes see material being ejected out of them. We'll show you some of that in a little bit. Okay, this is some of the prominences coming off. Uh, prominence is another, the fancy name for a flare. It's material coming off of the sun. And you say, well, they don't look too big. Well, I can guarantee you those are pretty big. Um, if you put a, our Earth up there, it would be probably about, probably about like three or four Earths and that the brighter one towards the bottom, you could probably put three or four Earths in that little V there. Here's another active region. And uh, when you see these active regions, you can actually, uh, there are names for each one. I belong to a group in England. It's called Solar Chat and Online. And people who are really into solar astronomy, that's all they do around there. And some of the photographs you see in there would just knock your socks off. They're just incredible. But uh, every uh, active region, NASA gives them a, uh, a designation number, like active region one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And you can keep track of all that stuff. Uh, here's what I did showing almost three dimensional effect. Some of this is not really three-dimensional, but it looks like it because of the lighting, the way it hits that, way it uh, sort of comes off the surface. You can do some really pretty neat things that way. Okay, again, this is, and one thing I wanted to mention, you notice this is an orange sun, right? What color is our sun? Well, it's not orange, it's not really yellow, whatever. It can be any color you want because when you take these pictures, you don't do them in color. And I'll explain that in my part when I get into the actual image of them. But, the color is uh, basically what you ever want. If you want a green sun, a yellow sun, blue sun, you make anything you want. In that picture, I talked about the white area being hotter, you know, very hot part. Those black lines are actually prominences that normally, they're the stuff you'd see coming out the side of the sun, but when it comes towards you like that, it's moving so quickly, it changes the frequency of the light. And so it actually looks like a black, piece of lint or dust or whatever laying on the sun's surface. And those are all called filaments. Okay, here's one I did pretty recently. I think this is about, I think, three months ago or so. And what this has, as you can see, I don't know if I can blow it up here or not. No, I can't here. Uh, but the, the flares are prominent. These are on the edge. Um, you can see the the wider parts, that is the uh, hot areas. You can see the filaments in that picture. Um, and also uh, something you can quite wonder about, well, that picture looks like it has kind of a, not quite perfectly centered to the background there. Well, the reason for that is when you take these pictures to see both of these, you can't take a photograph that will show both the surface like it is here and also the prominences at the same, same time. What you have to do is you have to process that picture twice once for the inner part, once for the outer part. Then you basically use Photoshop to stack them on top of each other. And you can also do time-lapse movies. Uh, this one, every time you see that blip, 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 okay, that is probably what, a couple, three seconds. That actually is about two or three hours of time taking pictures and you put them into like a movie to show them so it's like a stop light or stop stop action type of thing. There's another one here in black and white, same thing. You can see every time it blips right there, there, do it again. So every time it blips, that's another, you know, probably two hours worth of imaging, but it shoved down into a time lapse. Um, also, as I mentioned here, you can orientate the orient, orientation of the picture and with the time lapse movie, sometimes the human mind sees stuff. That they know everything. Light is always top, right? Because you see things lit from the top. 
So the mind will see that and say, oh, that, that asteroid is 3D. So we'll try to make that into a, a curved surface and try to make it like there's actually light and shadows on there. There isn't, but it makes it look like there is. Okay, this is one I took in September 20th in 2023, so not too long ago. Very large prominence. And that one is pretty good size. I'd say that's probably, I don't know, put five or six Jupiters into there, at least I would think. It's pretty good sized. I did that one. I got double that one. Okay, now, uh, of course, the amateurs are getting the point now we can take stuff that will match what the professionals used to do just a few short years ago. But NASA is still, they have all the money, all the cool, cool toys. So I've got a two minute long video on here, and hopefully it won't blast everybody's ears out. I don't know if there's any sound with this or not. Maybe it's not going to work. Hmm. Well, maybe it's not going to work. Had this problem before. Hmm. Well, you're out of luck. Are, are you on the other? Yeah, yeah. I think what it is, um, I have, let me, let me try something. Maybe I can go this way. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. there we go. This is about two minutes long. Turn it down a little bit. Okay. Anyway, uh, one of the things they mentioned there was when you have something like a CME, does that hazardous to your health or on Earth? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it can be hazardous to you because if it comes directly at the U.S., I mean, at the Earth, uh, it can affect your power grid. Uh, it can take it out. Um, I don't have enough time to because I used to used to be an electrical engineer for the power company in California, and that's quite a quite a study in that. Um, they were trying to protect the whole solar system um, from, excuse me, the whole power system from that is expensive and difficult. And in fact, we even have had power outages due to that. Uh, when I first moved here, uh, well, actually my family moved here before I did in 2003, the end of 2003, if you lived here then, you probably remember they had a big power outage for a couple, three days around this area, Detroit and everything. And that wasn't due to that. That was due to basically just a, a screw up and it took out to a chain reaction, took a bunch of stuff down. But we learned from that and that you have to have uh, this type of stuff designed that when you have an outage, such as caused by a CME, it doesn't take everything out. So they'll have special machine uh, that switch the power grid parts of it off. So 
rather than just everything going down a bunch and daisy chaining, they can make it much safer. It's still not perfect, but I still have some problems with the way it is now. I think we could have some problems still. Uh, there was one really interesting uh, case uh, back in, I think I put the exact year, 1850 or so, 1859. And they had a big CME that came to Earth. And actually, luckily, we didn't have telephone. We didn't have computers. All we had was telegraph, you know, the tap, 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 tap. And what happened was, uh, and if you know anything about electricity, electrical engineering or anything, the way a transformer works, there will be two poles, you might say. This one has a bunch of wire wrapped around it. This one has a bunch of wire wrapped around it. And there's a ratio between this side to this side. This is 10 to maybe 100 to 1,000 on this side, let's say. Well, the difference is what changes the voltage. That's how you go from 12,000 volts distribution volts, your transmission down to the 120 volts in your house. Well, by the same nature, these coronal mass ejections can actually energize fences. Like you have strung out barbed wire fence, uh, wires on poles. Well, what happened, that CME was so powerful, actually it energized through the, the telegraph line down the pole line, and it caused uh, sparks onto the desk of these guys, the teleprompter operators. They actually started a desk on fire, the papers laying around, it actually started fires. That was not that big of a deal then. But now let's go the other way. If you had that happen today, uh, probably right. it would take out our grid system. It was a really bad CME. Um, it would attack, take out electronic devices and space, all of our satellites, and everything else. Uh, right now, we have space weather. Uh, that's a big deal. So we were talking earlier about your alarm going off when you have all kinds of activity going on. Uh, we constantly are, are monitoring that. So if you have a coronal mass ejection coming towards here, they can take the satellites, turn them off, rotate them away from the sun, whatever. But not always. <laughs> and big one is uh, if you have uh, a coronal mass ejection, it also can wipe out your computer chips and everything. Say, oh, no big deal. So it wipes out our computer chips. We'll just get some more computer chips and put them in there and fix them, right? Well, what makes computer chips? Other computer chips make computer chips, right? Yeah. And if you no longer have those original computer chips that made those computer chips, how do you make computer chips? Do you still have the plans to make those old computer chips? You know, they claim that if you have a CME equal to that one we had back in 1859, yeah. uh, it could put us back in the Middle Ages for a long period. So. August 1972, August 4th, 1972, solar storm caused the accidental detonation of numerous U.S. naval mines near uh, North Vietnam. Yeah. Yep. And it is, it's scary. You know, a lot of times people like to think it's over. We can handle anything. Well, not, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Now, this one here, we're going to talk a little bit about the tools and the capture and processing steps to get an image. Mm. I've already talked about the telescopes and stuff you can use. Well, these are examples. Some of the things that I use, I know Dill uses these also. In fact, some of these I got based on his recommendations. So if they, anything goes wrong, I'll blame you for it. <laughs> this, uh, the neat thing about solar astronomy, you don't have to have a cool or really expensive camera. Uh, also, you want a mono, a black and white camera. Um, the reason for that is because a mono camera actually has better resolution uh, you're using the full chip to get the image rather than the, the one red, two greens, and blue on, on a color chip. So it's better for that. Um, this camera is probably, I think we paid under was about 300 bucks or less than 300 bucks for these. We bought them deal. And you don't need to buy an expensive camera. Um, on your uh, picture there, the one in the middle is a little like a sack. Uh, basically, it's a spring loaded little like a tent. When it opened up, it looks like at the bottom, sitting there on that table. Uh, what this is, is a device you can put your laptop inside of because when you're outdoors trying to take pictures of the sun, it's so bright, it wipes out the view on the screen, right? So these things are really great. I got this Amazon. It's got silver on the outside and black on the inside. So um, it doesn't get all hot inside. And you can fold it up very quickly. Put it, put it back in your little gear bag and everything else. Um, you use uh, boxes, right? You use uh, toolboxes or milk cartons? I have more of them. But oh, yeah. Well, no, okay. 
But a lot of people, they just take illegal. Well. Yeah, flat cardboard box, old milk carton you didn't take illegally from your grocery store. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're a really cool thing to have. And you can see how they work right there. I've got my laptop in there with a picture of the sun on it. And you take it outside, works great. Doesn't take a lot of space up. Towel over your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put a towel over your head. Yep. Okay. Crazy, man. Something years ago about his neighbors thinking he was crazy because he was out in his dryer and towel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, people say, well, how about your mount you have? You have to have an expensive mount. All you need is a, a basic motorized mount that will track the sun more or less. You don't have to be very exact. This was a Altaz uh, Chinese mount that's called a mini tower. And any mount you have that will track the sun more or less is fine because you're not going to take a long exposure. The sun is so bright, which is great, that you don't have to have long exposures like you do in nighttime photography. So you can take a lot of pictures and how you do that. Well, you don't take single pictures. What you do is you shoot a video. You shoot a video and every frame is a picture, right? So these pictures are you know milliseconds long, each one. And when you're done, you take this into some software and then handle it. I'll talk about that, how you do that in a second. Okay, here, the most difficult part of this is finding the sun and finding the focus point with new gear. And literally, you say, well, why is it so hard to find the sun? Well, because when you look through a telescope at the sun, all you see is black except when you finally have the sun into it, right? Well, there are, on your telescopes, you can get devices, they're called solar finders, which are little simple devices, which either have a couple of, uh, one, the front will have a whole tiny pinhole through it, the back there's a little plate, and the back here projects the image of the sun onto that. So you can use that to aim your telescope. That uh, virtual wedge I had, I talked about how it shows actually a picture of the sun in the back of that device, but, some of those devices, when you're going to really high magnification, you're talking about really high magnification and trying to find that little P <laughs> and that huge sky is really difficult. And then the other thing is once you get there, trying to get a focus, because when you first buy this equipment, you got to find out where is the focal point. Well, the neat thing about things like that, the Lantern, and the Coronado, H off with the big scopes, they're easier to focus because they're already pre-designed by the manufacturer. There's an L range they come into focus. But some of the equipment, though, you have no idea of knowing where it is. I've got one set up using that uh, the Daystar. Well, I actually have to use two extensions, and I've got a special uh, device holds filters. The whole thing, before it even touches the telescope, is about this long. And all that, you have to calculate, do the math, figure out the math, and get a focus, which is kind of fun at times. <laughs> okay, the software is cool for this because most of it is free. Um, the one I use is SharpCap. And They've got two versions of that. One is free. The other version they have, you pay more. I think you pay a little bit every year for it, rent it, basically. And that fancy version has a, uh, a polar alignment and a couple other minor features on it. But this the basic one is fine. Uh, Auto Stacker is a German program. And uh, it's freeware again. And that program stacks all your images. And I'll tell you how you do that in a second. And then uh, I use Photoshop only because I'm a, because of my old photo business, I've used Photoshop all my life ever since they first came out with it. So it's a great program if you do photography or anything like this, but it's expensive. Um, there are cheaper and free alternatives. So if you get into this, you might want to research some of those other free ones. One of the alternatives I suggest would be paint.net. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I mentioned about the mono camera, uh, why you want that. Uh, I've talked about the telescopes, different types, and the mounts. Again, you can't really do this, take pictures. If you have a mount that's just sitting there, they can't move at all. It's going to be a real pain. You need something that at least moves a little bit with the sun to keep it more or less on your film strip or on your camera. Um, yeah, how do you do it and how much time is involved? Well, the neat thing about this is actually it's pretty quick, pretty fast compared to nighttime imaging. Nighttime imaging can take a long time, hours of exposures and blah, blah, blah. And solar astronomy happens very quickly. so. First of all, get your gear set up so everything comes into focus. Adjust your exposure with a slider in sharp cap. There's a little slider in real time. You can slide it and you can actually see 
the images coming up with on screen. And you look for, there's a certain point on there where you want to look on the um, histogram, you know, where you get enough of the image on there. And I won't get into how the thing actually works because once you get it, the best way to learn how to use this stuff is to get online, do a YouTube and look for the actual, uh, in this case, sharp cap. And they go through the whole process from A to Z. Um, and you capture these images. So I usually do it in a what they call an AVI mode. And it takes a video. And I usually ask it to take 2,000 images. Well, 2,000, that's a lot. Well, not really when they're micro, you know, micro part of a second. So it takes no time at all. You, you know, it'll be just a few minutes. Um, okay, after you get those 2,000 images, you've got two choices. One is you can do it in 8 or 16-bit format. Uh, if you're only doing just the surface, only just doing the prominences, you can do 8-bit. If you want to try to do both, Actually, it's a good idea maybe to take 16-bit because that way you can have more detail in both the prominences and more detail in the surface part so you can have more to work with. Okay, once you do that, you do out a video. Okay, well, you want to convert that video into individual single frames. So it's basically, take each one of those out. And you go to Otter Stacker, this program, which is free. And it automatically... Uh, what you do, it'll take 2,000 pictures you've used, and you don't want to take all 2,000 because some of them won't be good. You see, why won't they be good? Well, I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Um, it will take 2,000 photos, and it will line and stack and output into a DNG or a TIFF file, uh, which is a type of a file, picture file. Um, but you only select the 15% of the best. You don't want to take all of them because if you take all of them, it's going to get the bad pictures, the ones are blurry and everything else. Okay, now you import it into Photoshop or some other photo program and use that to sharpen it. You can adjust the contrast, uh, do all kinds of things with a histogram and play with it. This you don't do when you're out in the field. This you do at home when you got more time, then it's not beating down on you. So the actual imaging of this, uh, taking a picture of the sun can take maybe three or four minutes. Uh, thinking you you're outside, setting it up might take you, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or maybe half an hour, depending on how fast you're able to set everything up. Um, so it doesn't take much time to capture the images. So you can get tons and tons of these images put aside for later processing. What takes the time is going into Photoshop and start playing with it. And you can do all kinds of things with Photoshop. Again, if you go to uh, online YouTube and they have tons of examples how to do that. Uh, okay. One thing you do want to do after you're done with that uh, is take all this and make a colored picture if you want. You can leave it black and white, as some of mine were black and white. But you can also go in and colorize and say, okay, I want to make the sun yellow or blue or green or purple, whatever. You can do that. <clears throat> okay, I talked about uh, capturing detail. On the left and the right were taken within five minutes of each other. Say, well, why is the one on the right so blurry? When you look to a telescope, especially at high magnification, you're going to see the pictures go sharp, blurry, sharp, blurry, 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 sharp, blurry, blurry, blurry. It changes very quickly because of things like the uh, the atmosphere, um, you know, jet stream, and everything else can all impact this stuff. So that's why when you're taking the pictures and stacking, well, you tell the computer to go through, and it automatically will wait each one for how sharp it is or not sharp how blurry it is, and you say, just take the 15% of the best ones and use those stack those. That's how you get the better quality pictures. Okay, that's pretty much it. Uh, these are the credits here for most of these pictures were by me. There's a couple of which I noted on the picture that were by other people. Um, and all the advertising down below that is all the where I got information to use on this talk. Um, again, you know, the best way to learn this stuff is to get together with somebody who's doing it. You got the time to sit down with you and you can actually watch over the shoulder doing this. Um, there's a, a couple a couple of guys in the uh, Oakland Club and myself are really into the solar astronomy. So we've got a lot of things we learned together. Uh, so it's kind of neat. Um, I know you've done some solar stuff. Um, who else? Have you, you haven't done any. I'm, I guess... I don't know if Bill Beers has done either, but I know there's some people in the club that have been doing solar. You've done solar too, right? Just the white light. White light, okay. And white light's fun too. I mean, you can get a lot of 
cool things in white light uh, with the sunspots. You start practicing how to get really sharp and everything, big magnification. You can, like that one picture I had where you go really into it and see all the detail in the sunspot. That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Anybody qu have any questions or anything? We've got two minutes left for questions. So when do we have to leave here? Nine o'clock or? Oh, okay. We got time then. Okay. Good question. On the Herschel way, mm -hmm. you said there's like a ceramic plate. Right. Yeah. It's basically just where your mirror would be. There's this uh, ceramic piece in there. Like yeah. It's an angle, just like you just like your dag. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the reflective enough for you to see. Right. Yeah. It, it's enough it's reflective the, light. You can see it. You know, if you look visually through it, you'd actually see it. But probably. 99 point whatever percent of the heat and radiation are going right through it to, and that uh ceramic is basically like the ones they have in the heat shield for the space shuttle you know it's they can stand hundreds and thousands of degrees temperature without destroying itself we have vents in the back. yeah it has vents in the back although it has vents but you can touch it and it's not that hot you know um now the old original ones the herschel wedge they didn't have the ceramic they had i'm not certain how they exactly work but they put out heat, they dumped it. Most of the heat they dumped out through a portal. And I don't know if it came out the bottom, the side, whatever. So you didn't want to be around that portal. When the heat came out, it was really hot. So you had to make sure you stayed away from that. Is there any reason you couldn't take an eclipse viewer like this mm -hmm. and use it to go to the for a finding scope? Probably not. You probably could. Uh, except that's so small, it'd be hard to make one. If you had a bigger one, you could. But the problem is, by the time you get a bigger one of those, just buy the beta, which is really the ideal one. I use the brand of Thousand Oaks off. Yeah, the yeah, Thousand Oaks, yeah. They have a good stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, polarizer. Right, right. Right, yeah. right. 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 Uh, on a Herschel wedge, actually, due to the nature of the the ceramic or whatever, it actually does polarize the light. So you can mount a, another uh, uh, polarized lens. You can buy right, like once you use for a, a moon, viewing the moon and everything. Put that on there. As you rotate that filter, I mount mine on my uh, eyepiece. So as you rotate the eyepiece, it actually goes from undim to all the way completely black. You can fine tune it exactly where you want it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, the Herschel wedge is probably the ultimate as far as the quality of the pictures you get and everything. It's even better than the yeah, yeah, for white light. Yeah, but not for the H alpha. It's not H alpha. Have you ever done any calcium thing? No. Uh, I will say calcium is another range of light you can photograph in. And some manufacturers, uh, I think Coronado or Lunt both, they have a version of their solar telescopes you could buy that are calcium, and which is actually the blue range of light. And don't do it. Don't ever buy one of those. They're very dangerous. I don't know how they get away doing that. Yeah, uh, yeah they, yeah, they, uh, in fact, uh, Daystar, they, they say, we would never sell you one to be used visually because <laughs> the radiation letting through will damage your eye. Yeah, photography only. But they actually sell them. I know the lunch actually sells them as possible to use for visual, I think. Yeah. It, it, the light spectrum is essentially in the ultraviolet anyway. Yeah. You know, most people can't even see it. They say yeah. children yeah. and people with recent cataract surgery are the only people who can actually observe that frequency yeah. of light barely. Yeah. So it's 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 used for yeah for yeah photography. Yeah, photography. Yeah, you can't see prominences, but you can see structure. A different type of structure on the surface. I didn't. I didn't know if you had, we didn't have any examples here, but mm -hmm. you'll often see them looking purplish. Right. Right. Yep. Uh, the sunspots look mm -hmm. whitish, and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't. Know, it's hard to describe. You'd have to take a look at it's like, oh, okay, that's yeah, yeah. And what I would do, it's like, it's a neat effect. Yeah. If if you go to the websites for Blunt or. Uh, uh, Daystar, particularly, you go to their websites, they'll have examples of the different types of filters. And like I say, when you get into like the Daystar, ones that are really expensive, thousands, thousands of dollars, those are really precisely manufactured to be only an ultra narrow spectrum. They're exactly right on. And 
you know, but again, unless you're a professional, you know, be prepared to pay lots of money. It's also thousands, thousands of dollars for some solar dynamics observatory. There are different screens you can scroll mm -hmm. through. Yeah. I think they take in all these frequencies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. If you can go, I don't, I should have, if I had this uh, plugged in, I could show you. I've got a link to the SDO and everything. And they have all the different frequencies and the infra, you know, the near infrared, and they have a, a UV like that one they had with the uh, the NASA one. I think it said that was what that was. It said on there what it was infrared or something, but it was nothing that we would have access to for a while. You know, maybe UV. I don't know what it was, something, but it wasn't something we would normally have access to. They got the bunny. <laughs> well, actually, they have our money. But <laughs> okay, any other questions? And like I, uh, I would suggest if you're really interested, uh, when we do some of these uh, presentations to the public, come along. You can assist with us. Uh, you know, you can help us, and you can see, look through these scopes. A lot of times, I'll bring our solar scopes out, set them up, and so we'll let me have to make something into the chat that might be a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's that? You get that? Oh, oh, just there. Oh, no. oh, all right. Okay. Okay. But like I say, uh, solar astronomy is really cool. And uh, if you stick to the white light, it's not bad, not that expensive. When you get into the H alpha stuff, it gets more expensive. Probably, I would say, maybe $1,200 or so, $1,500 to get into a, a good H alpha, smaller size scope. On up to maybe five, six thousand, eight thousand dollars for some of these real expensive ones. But uh, look for if you want to get into it, look through other people's first, see if it's for you. I'll guarantee you, once you do it, once you get into it, you'll be hooked. <laughs> One last thing um, the Association of Lunar and Planetary mm -hmm. Observers on their solar group, uh, there was a, so I, was, I was actively, you know, doing the white light. You know, observe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the astro body. And somebody said if you use you no know, use your white light filter, but use a green retina filter in your eyepiece, mm -hmm. it really enhances. So oh, you brings stress. it up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because your eyes, I guess your eyes are really you know, just like with the green laser. Yeah, yeah. You know, what you can see right. Mm -hmm. now. This doesn't really makes that detail. Mm -hmm. Like yep, yep, so that's true. Do that. Although, if you have eyes like my eyes, it's not going to help me. Yeah. <laughs> I know I know it's different, but I did it. Oh yeah. It was pretty yeah. Good. Oh yeah. Observing it for a long period yep. of time. In fact, the uh um the virtual wedge I have actually the solar continuum filter you put on with that, that also brings out more detail. And you can get different types of filters, like there's uh uh infrared path, infrared cut filters, and there's if you go on the solar groups or you know people really into this thing, you'll see all kinds of interesting tricks they do to bring out more detail. I can, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, stop sharing this. All right, so we're wrapping this up here. So says our next open house and star party is at Stargate in two days on Saturday. Our next board meeting is in four days on Monday, so be, be prepared for a message from me, board members. Uh, our next general meeting will be at Cranbrook on April 1st, and we're going to meet afterwards at the Coney Island. Now, which uh, at the National Coney, now, which one do you guys want to meet at? Because there's this one on 12 Mile and Grossbeck, and there's the one we used to do with the Van Dyke and 12 Mile, but I'm, I'm thinking the one 12 and Grossbeck is only, like, just up the road here, so... All right, so with that, we're going to sign off and good night and clear skies, everyone. Have a good night. No, we got plenty of time. We got we got 50 minutes. All right, so good night, everyone. Bring down.